reaching out to different people. And each name to each person that I want to talk to, I'm going to speak to you in this peace and solidarity. Why peace and solidarity? Because we are in a war in which all of us are engaged in it, either passively or aggressively, right? Either consciously or unconsciously. But before I get into any of all, or all of that, right, let me just give you some background. Uh, I was asked to give you some, share some information of who, who am I and where did I come from, right? And so that's what I'm going to do. I was born October 18th, 1951, Oakland, California, 3.43 a.m. at Kaiser Hospital. My mom was a, um, a student of African dance at the time of my birth and growing up. I used to teach African dance to my sister and I. And so we used to do all the African cultural dance and so forth and so on. And one thing she told us in terms of our teaching us African dance was she had taught, what she had learned from her own uh, uh, teacher, her own instructor, uh, was that we are African. Right. I was raised with the idea and the identity of being of African descent. All right. We did not accept the idea of the reality of imposed identity, like being a Negro or being a, a coon, or being a colored person, or being any other derogatory name that was imposed upon us as a people here in North America. I was raised the idea of an African descent. Okay. And that's how I went to school, with those ideals, right? with that belief system, right? with that identity. That's how I was raised. So I was raised in a household where the, the icons of the movement from Dr. Martin Luther King to Marcus Garvey to uh, uh, Rap Brown, now known as uh, uh, Imam uh, Al-Amin, Jamil Al-Amin. We had to have a picture on our wall, Ron Kalinga. We used to have pictures in our living room, right? I was raised with that identity, knowing that we had leaders and it was a, a history, a, a, a legacy of resistance amongst black people here in Turo Who's Turo Oh, Turo uh, the original name of this country we call the United States. To and therefore, there's only been resistance here. So let's, let's go. So growing up, at the age of nine, I had one major experience that taught me a, a huge lesson that I remember today. I was raised in the area at the time of Jim Crow, right? Jim Crow grew out of another lawless, not law, uh, uh, of population control of the Black Codes, right? Not after Reconstruction. Right, the issue is black hole. I'm going to talk about that in a few more details as well. Uh, so in Jim Crow, one of the things that black people had to do at that time was sit at the back of the bus. Right? And so I had to go to across town. I was at a campus in San Francisco. And um, I was going to, I was doing a Catholic school, right? So I was, I was baptized in, uh, as a Catholic. Uh, and I'm going to talk about that too. <laughs> So, um, so I go to Catholic school for at least for the first five years, six years, and then come back. So, for all kinds of reasons. Uh, but on my way to school, nine years old, I decided I'm going to sit in front of the bus with the white folks, right? And so I can do so. And the bus driver told me, "No, take your black behind the back of the bus." One white woman stood up and said, "No, he can sit up here with me." And the bus driver was going to have a problem with the white woman in the middle of the day. I was going to the middle of the morning, right? So he said, all right, sit there. So I sat with her, right? And then when she got off of the bus, I heard the bus stop, she got off and she left, right? Bus driver turned to me and said, listen, now she's gone, go back to the back of the bus. Now you go. I stood up, I looked around to see if there was any other white person, any other person, male or female, would stand up and say, I can sit in this area. None did. And then what I do, I went to the back of the bus. Right? That was the rules, that was the regulations, that was the policies, that was the law then. But what's the lesson? The lesson is this that you have individuals and their moral, ethical understanding of the world we live in, and say they refute the law. The law is wrong. The application of the law is wrong. And she had the moral standing, the ethical standing to say, no. No. Right? And 
then you turn around, you look around, and you say, oh, what happened to everybody else? Why did she have this in herself, in her presence, in her consciousness, and everybody else in that bus did not, white people, did not? Right? They would adhere to a law that they know is wrong. It's more than ethically wrong. Why? Because it's wrong. It's written that way. Alright? So that's my nine-year-old experience and understanding that there are some people who believe in justice and righteousness and will live up to that creed, will live up to that understanding, right? And there are others who say they believe in it, but refuse to act. Right? Refuse to put their blood on the line. By the time I turned 16, um, I decided I'm going to join the Black Lives Party. My mom had been a member of the NAACP, right? Uh, during the time of uh, 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 Martin Luther King was doing his demonstrations and, and protests and marches and so forth. And so she used to package along with them, right, on those marches, civil rights marches. And so I cut my teeth in terms of protests and demonstrations as a young kid, right? Not understanding everything that was going on, but I knew that we had to. Be out here to do this work. By the time I turned 16, I decided I'm going to back down the party. I had seen them when they went on uh, March uh, in, in Sacramento, right, uh, protesting um, um, the changing of the uh, I think it was the Mumford Law, right. Uh, prior to that, California used to be an open carry state, right. Open carry state is no less than this. Uh, open carry state and when the Black Panther Party began to carry openly, by law, right, weapons, and securing our community, ensuring that our, our, our people are not being brutalized and, and uh, tormented uh, by the uh, law enforcement during that time, right, they decided to change the law. Hmm, that's interesting, right? When black people arm themselves to defend themselves, they change the law. And so when I saw these black men, young black kids, black men, the Red Black Panther Party was for most part a youth organization, right? And the inception of the Black Panther Party was no one older than the age of 30, 30 years and under, right? People in their teens and their 20s, right? Uh, staunch, staunch, staunch fighters, revolutionaries, lovers of the people, lovers of themselves, right? And so I decided, Having gone through tr traditional processes, when I say traditional processes, in terms of the African community, right, of discovering myself as an African person, evolving towards African uh, uh, cultural naturalism. I was involved in an organization called US, immediate, uh, 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 as an early age, about 15, 14 to 15. US organization was an organization that was organized by uh, an app named Ron Brigham, Malala Ron Brigham, brilliant man, brilliant, brilliant, but unfortunately he um, got used. And that's no story. Uh, uh, and there was a split or dynamics involved that the FBI and Cointelpro created dissensions and, and separations and animosity between us organization and the Black Panther Party. Uh, so I decided to transition. And in 16, uh, I had some elementary school friends of mine who were also members of the Black Panther Party. Uh, prior to that, we the same school friends of mine. We used to have a two hour school. We used to sing on the corner. I do obviously in that nation, you know. Uh, and one time we used to have more than the same. Not anymore. All right. So, um, in fact, yeah, we, went, we came in second place uh, at the San Francisco team competition. Uh, we all the organizations came in second place in the team, team competition. It was pretty good. We seemed like we were a record deal. Unfortunately, we were the wrong time. <laughs> the day you can break your own. And that, right? Mm -hmm. So at 16, I went into the uh, uh, into the Santa Fe Party office and signed up to become a member. Right? And one thing you have to do when you get involved with that kind of party, you have to study. Right? You have to go through what they call PE, political education class. Right? Before you get into TE, which is technical education. Right? And that means you're using arms and weapons and so forth and so on, right? You have to go through the PE and actually go through the process. Right? Uh, <clears throat> by the time I turned 18, right, I was really fully engaged in the Black Panther Party and the work we were doing, and I got recruited into what's called the Black Underground. Right? At 18 years of age. 
Black Underground evolved, became known as the Black Liberation Army. Right? By the time I was 19, uh, and I'll just briefly give you the story of what happened. Uh, they killed uh, Comrade George Jackson on August 21st, 1971. Right? He murdered him, John Quentin. Uh, he was the field marshal for the Black Panther Party uh, in the prison system. The following week, the following week, uh, I was arrested, uh, uh, allegedly in an attempt to retaliate for the murder of Comrade George Jackson. And uh, as a result of technical equipment failure, uh, there was a car chase shootout, in the, and I got ass kicking while he was one of the ladies after they busted me, right? Uh, yeah, and so. Uh, at that point in time, I got charged with the various uh, uh, incidents uh, throughout the uh, Bay Area and uh, also in New York. Uh, and it led to me being sentenced to three different cases, uh, shootout in San Francisco, bank robberies, and murder of two police officers in uh, New York. We can talk about that in more depth if you'd like to, because there's some issues that are wrong with these convictions uh, that are historic. Uh, and cover up, cover up to a whole bunch of shenanigans. Uh, <clears throat> but anywho, um, as a result of my conviction, uh, I spent 49 years in prison. From the age of 19 to the age of 19, to the age of uh, 68. I've been out a little more than two years now. A week, uh, two years and, and a week and a half. I was released in 2020, October 6, 2020. Right. Uh, from 1971 to 2020. I went to the Pro Board 13 times. 13 times to the Pro Board, right? And uh, on my 14th, they finally let me go. There's a story behind that as well. Uh, and I'll just be briefly, and then we're going to talk about other things. <clears throat> uh, the story is this. Two years ago, right before COVID became the pandemic that we you know it to be, um, there was concerns about what was happening inside the prison systems, what I call penal slave system, um, uh, regarding to uh, this COVID. How they're going to treat people who have been infected. I saw a black sergeant come into a, the, the, the housing area on his camp, and she was wearing a mask. She was wearing a mask. So I walked up to him and I said, hey, why are you wearing a mask? Everybody's curious. Why, why are you walking around here wearing a mask? She said, well, you know, she said she's sick and she feels that she needs to make sure that everybody else stays well. That did not satisfy me, all right? So, <laughs> no. So I had to do some more investigation to find what's going on. And eventually it came to a point where um, uh, the Department of Correctional Services was so in disarray in terms of how they were handling COVID <laughs> that my attorney filed a habeas corpus petition uh, uh, to have him released until uh, the department finds out ways how they're going to manage this idea of, of COVID. And uh, lo and behold, the judge granted it. A superior court judge granted me release, temporary release, until DLCS uh, find out how they're going to handle this matter of, uh, of uh, COVID. Okay, what happened? <clears throat> In our Attorney General, Letitia James, right? who was known to be progressive as I got the position, right, appealed the decision for me to be granted release, temporary release. And in the interim of fighting that appeal, I got COVID. Right. Now I was put into, uh, I went to, they had to take me to uh, 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 Albany Medical Center. I stayed in the Albany Medical Center five days on oxygen. Right, five days. And they shot me in every kind of building you can imagine. We heard that, that, that knucklehead who used to be in the White House, Trump, talking about he got, I got what he got and some, right? <laughs> yeah. But I got to go to, uh, to uh, Albany because it saved my life, right? But now, what happened to court? The federal court said, wait, listen, um, the appeal was for him to be released before he got COVID. He's got COVID. The case is new. Right? But what we originally brought the case for was we to be released so I wouldn't get COVID, now I have COVID. So I said, hey, we dismiss this. 
All right. So several months later, I went back, went back to the full board, the Sam and Joseph full board, and they recognized uh, the conflict. And this time around, they granted me my release uh, as a result of this. So I maybe maybe I need to uh, uh, have some kind of tribute to COVID. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds strange, right? But anyway, <laughs> that was my reality. That's how I got out on October 6, 2020. All right. And since being out, I got involved in an organization called uh, Citizen Action. We'll talk about that hopefully a little later. And um, been organizing since I've been out. Uh, that's what I do. I was organizing while I was in prison. I was organizing while I was in prison. Uh, Dr. Um, um, uh, Rifford, he made some mentions of some of the work that I was doing while I was in prison. And come back out of prison, back at the job. All right, this is what we do. We organize. All right. We have to get organized. There's a must. Right. Why? Because the opposition is organized. Right. They've been organized for the last 400 years. 400 years. Right. And, and I just want to make mention of this, and we'll talk about it even deeper uh, as we go into questions and answers and so forth. But it's important for us to understand what black, brown, indigenous people have suffered in this country for the last 100 years. We have been degraded, we've been dehumanized, we've been devalued, we've been demeaned for 100 years under a system of white supremacy. Right? A system that is required to have people who be inferior to other people. Right? In order for people to be superior, for people to be superior, they have to be people to be inferior. And they organize themselves in the capacity to ensure that those individuals who they deem to be inferior stay inferior. All right? I, I, I remember uh, giving a presentation, as a matter of fact, I gave a presentation uh, uh, three weeks ago. I was in um, Athens, Greece, for the uh, International Anti Imperialist Symposium. And I gave a presentation there. And basically, I told the Europeans, all right? That they'll never be free. They'll never be free until black people are free. None of us, none of us on this planet will be free of imperialism, of capitalism, of white supremacy until black people are free. Bottom line. And that's hard for people to chew on. It's hard for people to internalize to understand. But if you look around the world, Condition the status of black people around the world. I'm here to go to Australia, go to Germany, go to Brazil. We're oppressed. We're repressed. Right? That's our reality of a system of supremacy. Now, so I explained in when I was in Greece that this idea of white supremacy comes from 1493. 1493. Right? By an organization called the Catholic Church. All right? They issued a patent bull called the Doctrine of Discovery. Right? If you haven't heard it, Google it. The Doctrine of Discovery, right? By Alexander the Sixth, Pope Alexander the Sixth. The Doctrine of Discovery. And what he said, he told the, 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 the Spanish and the Portuguese, right? You have the right, the blessings of the church to go around the world and find those individuals who are not adherent to the idea of Christianity to rule over them. To rule over them. 1493. They've been gone ever since. Ever since. Right? The Portuguese, the Dutch, the English, the Spanish, right, the progenitors of the Atlantic slave trade, the Dutch as well, right? 1492, right, the Doctrine of Discovery. So they're saying that wherever the Portuguese and the Spanish go, and they find people that are adherent to the ideas of Christianity, that they can be conquered. That's why we don't have assets today. That's why we don't have Inca today. That's why we don't have the Arawak today. That's why we don't have the Tiamos today. That's why the Cherokee, the Seminoles, the Creek, my grandmother, my great grandmother, the Creek, right? Creek of Muskogee out of Alabama. Black, 
They have been disarray in terms of their sovereignty, in terms of their nation. A sovereign nation. There's only one sovereign nation in the United States right now that has not been compromised in their capacity and all of African or black uh, indigenous called the Shunna. They're saying they maintain the treaties, um, maintain their sovereignty, and recognize as such. All, right. All others have been conquered and destroyed, annihilated, on the system of white supremacy. A system of white supremacy. Now, <clears throat> what is white supremacy? And I just want to, this is going to be an argument. All right. And, it's difficult for me to say this, you know, to the white people, right? You're sick. You're, you're sick, right? DSM is, is the book of uh, psychologists use, it's their manual, right? And in that manual, they have a particular criteria, a particular uh, um, position dealing with issues of superiority complex, right? Psychological superiority complex is a, is a mental disorder. This is a mental disorder. All right? Two on that. All right? Superiority complex, God complex, right? From which white supremacy derives from. This is the derivative of superiority complex. You superior to me and other people on the planet. Mm. That's not sickness. That's not mental disorder. And it's so manical that you annihilate people. Now you go racist to people. We live in my life. And they expect the world to support that. They say, it's okay. It's not okay. It never has been and never will be. Never has been and never will be. During the Iraq war, they killed one million people within two months. Wiped them off the planet. A million people gone in two months. On the lot. This is not have mass, a lot of mass uh, destruction. Right? Colin Powell had to go to the United Nations and apologize for the beat when it hadn't been due. Alright? That's why it's a privacy. Alright? They were annihilating people. And in history, throughout history, and we're still suffering from those conditions today. In fact, they're trying to restore the idea of the Confederates here in the United States. We know what happened January 6th. Right? And so this is what we're confronting today. This is what I actually want to talk about today. Right? Um, and what we are doing, black people, radicals, militants, you know, I'm using words in quotation, right? We're actually freedom loving people. What we're doing today. And I'm like, for liberation and independence. Independence from, independence from white supremacy. All right. There's an issue in regards to what happened with uh, Dr. Martin Luther King and his, uh, his movement for our integration and assimilation. All right. Uh, if you ever hear the story or read uh, his speech, uh, The Other America, right? In that speech, he began to question, began to question, right, his foundational movement of integration and assimilation. And it's important for us to understand that. So he began to realize to integrate into a system of white supremacy is to the detriment of people of color. To assimilate. And there are those in our people, are those of us who have assimilated. They have assimilated into a system of white supremacy. They will adhere to the ideals of white supremacy rather than the ideals of nationalism and independence and sovereignty. All right? So we have black enemies and black people. Right? And it's due to how they've been acculturated, how they've been indoctrinated. Right? I talked about the, uh, um, uh, the doctrine of discovery. And how did that translate here in the United States? You ever heard of Manifest Destiny? We trained in kindergarten. Pledge allegiance to the Corporation of the United States. So that's another story. All right? We pledge 
teaches to manifest destiny. Right? And the other idea is the Monroe Doctrine. You know about it? You heard about the Monroe Doctrine. Right? Because these are the, the are the, the policies and the philosophies and the ideas of the United States of America that was translated from the doctrine of discovery. You find a continuation. It's a continuance of the idea of the doctrine of discovery. Right? Newly created, newly evolved, a manifest destiny, and the Monroe Doctrine. And this is where we have today this 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 uh, growing fester of imperialism around the world. And it's based upon the foundational principles of white supremacy. So, um, I did the 49 years in prison, come back out, got involved with Courtney Jason on Citizen Action in New York, all right? Uh, I am the special, coordinate, special projects coordinator for Citizen Action, and one of the things I want to hopefully we'll get to talk about uh, at some point in time is the campaign that I'm now doing in regards to issues of our incarcerated workers. I do not use prisoners, I do not use convicts, I do not use cons. Right? Or inmates. They're incarcerated workers. All right? We have to change the language. Therefore, we change the narrative and the understanding of what's going on with the social order today. All right? Incarcerated workers, that's what they are. All right? And based upon that, based upon the law, remember, we're talking about law, 13th Amendment of the United States Constitution. If you're not familiar with it, then just make it plain. The United States Constitution in 1865 ended child slavery, chattel slavery, right? But it institutionalized penal slavery, right? It reads, slavery involves her servitude should not exist in the United States, right? Except for those who are newly convicted of a crime or in its jurisdiction. That exception clause, that exception clause informs the slavery was never born. Right? It was created and put into a called a penal system. That's what we have in the United States today. There's a case called Ruffin versus Commonwealth that informs us, still on the books, it's the law that states that prisoners are slaves of the state. Okay? Slaves of the state. And so at, at this point in time, I'm working on a campaign. There are two bills pending in the New York State Legislature to end compulsory labor in New York State. All right, but you cannot force these guys, these workers in prison, uh, to work for pennies on a dollar. All right, slave wages. All right. And it goes deeper than that in terms of what we're trying to do by changing the narrative, by changing the language. Right? Because if we can get these young people uh, uh, in the prison system, began to think of themselves as workers, because when they go in, more often, more often, they don't have any skills, they don't have any education, right? And then they're put into manual, manual labor inside the prison system for pennies of a dollar. And they, they don't want it, they don't do work. Right? Uh, they don't want to do it, but they have to do it because if you don't do it, you stay in your cell 24 hours, 23 hours a day. So they're compelled. Go out and do his job. And as you well know, the, the prison industrial complex or penal slave complex is a multi billion dollar industry. Right? Most recently, uh, Governor Hope has asked uh, corporations to reinvest in the prison system, right? In the penal or slave system. Why would a corporation want to invest in the penal or slave system? Why? Right? They're Goals and objectives to raise money and, and profits for their stockholders, for the stockholders. Okay? Why? Because they know they can reap these over profits from prisoners' labor, slave labor. There's nothing that's going on across this country. They're trying to end public education, trying to turn public education into private education, private systems, right? And charter schools. So what, that, what does that do for those in the quote unquote minority communities? We have them, they've already established the school to prison pipeline. School to prison pipeline, mass incarceration, that's what it's about. It's about population control. 
how to suppress a movement, particularly the black movement, right? Militant movement. And I use the, the carceral system to keep people in check. I give you another example of why. And we'll, we'll talk about that in, 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 in greater detail as we go on because uh, we are trying to address those issues on an international level, on an international scale. Uh, so we'll, we'll get that up in a minute. Uh, Bryce, can you put that, that sign up, please? Can't take that, let's go. Other times, I was teaching black history, and I was through program, right? I started in 1861, and I raised it all the way up to 1966. And October 1966, when the Black Panther Party came into existence. Now I had, in my classroom, I had Bloods, I had Crips, I had JDs, Gangsta Disciples, and other, you know, brothers, sisters, brothers inside uh, my class. But mostly the gang members, right? They gravitated to what they called me an OG. Right? <laughs> and I'm an OG, you know, take this out. And so, uh, so I had my class. And I brought them all over to 18, to uh, uh, 1966. And in 1966, what did they do? They closed the class. They closed the class. And put me in segregation for four months. Saying I was trying to teach these young people to not be gangsters. Right? To be militants, to be radicals, to be revolutionary. You know what? They're right. <laughs> <laughs> They're absolutely correct. Right? So we need to have them come out of the penitentiaries, out of these slave systems, as an asset to the community, and no longer coming out as a liability. So what they do, they put me in the box. Put me in the box for four months, all right, for a proof program, but they want me to teach about the Black Panther Party and history of legacy of, of resistance in this country. They want to make sure that these guys continue to have a gangster mentality, a criminal mentality, so when they are ultimately released at some point in time, they will come back in the community and create havoc and destruction. Right? And you have a revolving door, the citizens are revolving door. This is deliberate. This is designed. This is intentional. This is purposeful. Alright? We'll talk about that. Okay. So while I was in the box, I decided to say, listen, uh, uh, we'll talk about comrades. I said, it's time for us to have international jurors come back to the United States. All right. We had to come, like the uh, doctor mentioned, the UN, UN uh, uh, Prisoners Petition Campaign to the United Nations. The first one that's ever done, it's in the book, it's recorded in the book, um, uh, where I raised the issues of prisons and political prisoners bring to the international community. And we had the international jurors come and investigate the school of prisons just in the United States. And we found out, yes, they did. They made a movement based on their investigation. This means some of my comrades, a couple of them are still in prison today, 50 years later, all right? Uh, and decided that brutal prisons exist in the United States. Okay, I'll give you another example of that. Uh, I had the opportunity to have a reporter to speak to, um, uh, geez, what is the guy's name? Uh, Andrew Young. Andrew Young, some of you may remember, was a, a, a comrade of, uh, of Martin Luther King Jr., right? He was also the first black ambassador to the United Nations right, under the Carter administration. So I had the opportunity to have a reporter in Paris uh, ask him a particular question. I was in a, a Clinton Correctional Facility with comrades in California, both said, listen, we got a reporter from Dave Paris at the press conference with Andrew Young. Do you have any more questions you want to have him ask? I said, yeah, only one. One question, one question only. Ask Andrew Young if political prisons exist in the United States. Question was asked, and he asked, he answered perhaps thousands. He got vilified. He got called to the carpet, to the White House, told him to shut that down. Shut that kind of talk down. All right? So that was in 1981. You can Google Andrew Young's political prisons, New York Times. The articles will come up. All right? It's there. And so, in 2018, I'm in the box, Southport, right, which is a prison, uh, a slave system that everybody who gets convicted of an of of uh, uh, um, offense in prison, right, they have some long-term uh, solitary confinement, they send to Southport. Everybody in Southport is long-term confinement in the cell. 
So I'm telling you, I'm saying, hey, it's time for us to bring uh, the, uh, um, let's get our security back to the United States. So I, I wrote a proposal, I sent it to my comrade, he had a new movement, who's now the chairman of the National Jericho Movement, an uh, organization that I started back in 1996, 1998, right? Uh, it's now existed today, it's the premier, Organization to support political prisoners in the United States. Been going on for 22 years. So I was sending a proposal to him, and he also shared the proposal with another comrade of ours who just recently was released, Sekou Mzinga. Uh, Sekou, uh, some of you may know, was originally uh, was one person who was arrested for uh, the Brinks robbery, one, and also for the uh, liberation of Asada Shakur uh, in New Jersey. Right? Uh, getting her released from prison and uh, having her exiled in Cuba. Uh, for those who don't know, Asada Shakur, Google it. Right. If you haven't read her book, Asada, read it. Um, and so, they decided to take my idea and expand it, to broaden it. Say, yes, we don't have the international jurors coming back, but we're going to organize what we call a tribunal, international tribunal on genocides. Say, yeah, okay, that's what we're going to do. I don't need I'm giving back. That's all I'm doing. And they did that. On October 22nd through 23rd, or 25th, right, we had this National Tribunal. It was held at the Malcolm X Dennis Bass Memorial Education Center, which is known to be the Audubon Room, where Al Hazard Dennis Bass was originally murdered. All right, perfect place to have this National Tribunal. So we had nine international jurors come to the United States, from different parts of the world, and they, they uh, um, uh, took testimony from 30 witnesses, 30 witnesses, boxes and boxes of documents, boxes and boxes of documents, and on the 25th, they made a decision. They made a decision. The United States has been found guilty of genocide. There's been a whiteout. The president don't talk about it. I didn't think about it. There's been a whiteout. You know, I take white out and erase something on the big deal. They're trying to erase that verdict. A verdict against the United States had been engaged in genocides against black, brown, and indigenous people in this country. We've been going on for 400 years. Now, it's not the kind of genocide of the Holocaust where people are ushered into. Uh, um, um, these gas chambers, this is a slow, deliberate capacity in which people are deliberately prevented to prosper. To prosper. All right? Um, we're going to talk about genocide. I've got my book there. And I'm explaining to you what the word and the language of genocide. I don't have it off the top of my head. Uh, but it's in the book. And what impact it has had on us. Okay. Now, this is not the first time the idea of genocide has been raised. Two months after I was born, December 17th, 1951, the great Paul Robeson, the great W.B. Du Bois, some of you may have heard of these books, and the great William Patterson, filed the first petition to the United Nations to be charged genocide. The FBI refused to allow Paul Robeson to go to Geneva. Right? And when Patterson was over there, they tried to prevent him from coming back. This is how far they went to not allow the international community to understand the conditions of black, brown, and indigenous people here in the United States. Seventy years later, we raise it again, and we accomplished what they were unable to do. We got a verdict. And that's the condition that we're dealing with today. We are raising the goals and the objectives of our struggle. We are raising the narrative and understanding that we are engaged in a fight against our annihilation. They're planning. They're working very hard. What happened in January 6th? That's just the uh, shadow of the bow of what's coming. We have to be prepared for it. Right. 2024, after the election, we have this double head from us again. It's going to be deep. It's going to be deep. That's what I'm talking about. 
we have to start being fair. We have to start being fair, people. Right? Uh, the Confederate is not over. Right? The, the Civil War was, was a question of what to do about black folks. That's what the Civil War was about. Right? And it's been that dynamic in this country ever since. What to do about black folks? People of color. Right? And this is why the Black Panther Party came into existence. And it came out of a vacuum. It came out of a legacy of resistance. A legacy of resistance. Right? From the time of Amistad. Y'all remember, remember Amistad? They started moving Amistad. Right? And they took over the ship. Right? And Quincy, uh, Quincy uh, uh, John Adam Quincy, whatever his name is, uh, <laughs> yeah, uh, you know, was able to get them uh, released and sent back to, uh, uh, I think, to Ivory Yes, yeah, yeah. 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 that's right. That's what we got to say. Okay. We've been resisting ever since. Hundreds of slavery magazines in this direction. They didn't teach us. We don't know about right? the African Blood Brotherhood, armed communists, black, fighting the Klan. You don't tell us about it. Right? Robert Williams wrote the book, Negroes with Guns. The great Reverend Matt Turner, Gabriel Prosser. You never heard his name before? Right? These are resistance. I know you're going to have a A resistance, revolutionary. Right? And so, diggers of defense. Right? Armed diggers of the civil rights movement, protecting the civil rights uh, movement. So the Black Panther Party did not come out of the vacuum. It came out of the tradition of legacy of resistance against white supremacy, capitalist imperialism. All right? 400 years, we've been fighting, we've been engaged. All right? And for those of us that just take note of the fact that for black people in the United States, in the last 50 years, our population has not grown. All right? Between 11 to 13%. And if you read, understand genocide, it means in whole or in part. In whole or in part. Now, sorry, let me get the book. Sorry. Let me understand. <clears throat> what genocide is. This is the present convention, this is 1948, the Convention on Genocide, right? And it says here, uh, the following acts committed with the intent to destroy the whole or in part the national, ethnic, racial, or religious groups such as killing members of the group. Anybody got a question about that? Do they be killing them? Every day. Every day, black, brown, and indigenous persons are being murdered across this country. Some of you hear about it, majority of you do not. Every day. All right? Causing serious body of mental harm to members of the group. Yes, we've been traumatized. We're going to talk about that in some depth. Deliberately inflicting on the group conditions of life calculated to bring about its physical destruction in whole or in part. Imposing measures intended to prevent the birth within the group. Yeah. We know that the indigenous community. Taking their children, giving them to missionaries. Giving them to missionaries. Right? Cutting their hair, changing their names, not allowing them to use their language. For cultural racism. Destroying these communities. Right. If you look at the uh, foster care system in the United States today, you find many of the children in foster care are black and brown kids. What happened to the families? You saw these families, displacement of families, right? The majority of households, 70% of households, black, black community, single parent households, primarily for mothers, raising children. That's a fact. What has 
caused these conditions of, of destroying the nuclear family, why would anyone want to do so? Because it weakens the people, the community, the nation. It's deliberate. It's still intentional. It's purposeful. Forcibly charge your children of a group to another group. Right? I remember this in that. Remember the verse. All right. Mass prostration is limited in verse. There's another one. I don't think I have. Imposing measures intended to prevent verse within the group. All right? Mass prostration. Here we have young people born in the penal slave system at a young age. You know, you change the law under Clinton that a 16 year old can be sent to prison for life. 16 years old. Brain has not even fully developed. All right? For life. And so we have people go into prison. As teens and come out, gray hair old men. I use uh, I use uh, just the men for myself. Oh, man. <laughs> that's, that's my own family. I ain't saying it. Uh, <laughs> so, uh, so anyway, uh, yeah. And so they come out as old men. So what happened to the years of reproduction? Time of reproduction, mass incarceration. All the main people in prison can't reproduce. You know that has an impact on us as people, as a nation? Our growth, our prosperity? Of course it does. It's planned, it's deliberate, it's purposeful. All right? Now, it's Article 3 further states that the following can or shall be punishable genocide, conspiracy to commit genocide, direct and public incitement. To commit genocide, attempt to commit genocide, and complicity in genocide. It's 1948. You go to uh, 18 U.S.C. 1091. You'll find the United States has a treaty to the Genocide Convention of 1948. It's only federal books, right? Same idea, same principles in federal books. Do you think the United States is going to charge itself with genocide? No. Absolutely not. But they don't vote. They're in violation of their own rules, regulations, their own laws. All right. So we have the international community make a decision, make a verdict. And like I said, uh, two weeks ago, two and a half weeks ago, I was in Greece. And I shared that with the international progressive community uh, the decision of the, the verdict. Right. The verdict of the international judge. Oh, yeah. okay. Okay. Uh, we tell you this now. Okay. And I told the world, those comrades, tell your people at home, the United States has been found guilty of engaging in the practice of genocide against black, brown, and indigenous people. By international, and steam body of international jury. Right. And now, you can tell the United States you have no more right, you have no more ethical privilege to tell any other nation of human rights violations. You no longer have the, 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 the champion of human rights, the hypocrisy of democracy. All right? Now the, the world can say, yo, uh -uh. you have no right to tell us about us. Not saying that we may have human rights violations, but I'm saying that. But the United States is going to have the moral authority. All right. When they've been found guilty, the international jurors have been engaged in the practice of genocide. So those countries can now tell the United States, mm. All right? No, you can't come to our house and tell us what we're doing, and you ain't shaking out your own house. Right. You've engaged in the practice of genocide. You're killing people, creating conditions calculated to destroy them as whole or in part. This is where we are today, people. Right? This is where our struggle is today. We're putting out the word. Right? We're changing the narrative of our struggle. We are saying to the world, the United States engaged in the policy of practices of genocide against black and indigenous people. What we have to do, we have to get away from that. They're not going to change. Not with their own fruition. They may be forced to change. 
you gotta be careful. Because the gold will die hard. Right? They just don't wither away. They have to be ushered to the death pen of history. And that's our task. Alright. When I was a kid, I thought we were gonna have a life revolution in my lifetime. And I have grown, I have matured. I come to understand that this is not a sprint, this is a marathon. There's a marathon. And all of you young people here today, start preparing, right? When the baton gets passed in that marathon, have the hand out ready to snatch it up and move it forward. Alright? Be prepared. With that, I'll close the question and answer. Thank you.